Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm taking your questions on panoramic sunroofs, rust, engine noises, and more. This is episode 191 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, in order to get your question on a show like this, be sure to email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com. Put question for Charles in the subject, just like everyone else did here. Ask the question right at the top, mash the enter button a couple times, then give me the details of your question. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this, be sure to check the quick videos playlist on YouTube where I take one question per video. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. Two quick things before I get into your questions. Don't forget, if you want exclusive content, you can get nowhere else. Discounts that you can't get anywhere else either, as well as access to the VW Audi training manuals that I build. Check out the crew membership program. It's a great way to help support me, support the show, help me keep the lights on, literally, as well as get yourself some slamming discounts and premium content. The link is down in the description. You may also have noticed a Sunday video pop up here and there. These Sunday videos are going to become more frequent. I've become part of the expert council at the Survival Podcast answering car questions, so be on the lookout for that. I'll also be in those episodes linking to the full show, the audio version only, of course, over at survivalpodcast.com, but I just wanted to let you guys know that that's happening. It's a great community over there, a lot of really cool stuff, so I highly recommend you check it out. And with that, let's get into the questions. First one comes from Burke. Is it possible for a new fuel pump install to change acceleration slash responsiveness? Then he mashed the enter button a couple of times. Good job. I'm overseas in Italy and complied with the recall notice from BW for the fuel pump and had it changed by a local dealer. I could be wrong, but there seems to be a one second delay or interruption when accelerating hard from a standstill. Is this a common occurrence? I'm hesitant to return to the dealer because it was difficult to articulate what is occurring in Italian, I imagine. So there's no check engine light. I'm returning stateside this summer with the car and may wait to see if there's no immediate problem. Thank you. So um, out of all these suction pumps, which it's not actually the fuel pump, it's a piece of the pump. And I don't recall ever hearing any cases of, and I know I haven't experienced any or any in our shop, of performance issues after this was installed, as long as it was installed properly. So while I, I know you're hesitant to take it back, I might consider taking it back find a translator or something to maybe help you out and have them just double check your work because if it's not all hooked up right, then maybe you could get a similar problem or the exact same problem. This actually, the big thing was like, you might get a fuel smell in your vehicle. We did have a handful of customers that had that fuel smell, but um, man, it's gonna be worth taking in, I think. I'm not surprised there's no codes. This type of problem rarely has a fault code associated with it. And if it does, the light's on anyway, so you know there's something going on. If it were me, I would wanna take it there. I would also have very low expectations that they were gonna fix anything or find anything wrong with it. Some things I would pay attention to. Does this happen every single time? Did it only start happening after this service was performed? What's the fuel level when it's happening if it's not happening all the time? If something's happening at low fuel levels or high fuel levels, it could be an installation problem. Also, what's the fuel gauge doing? Is it accurate within reason? Maybe the pump's clocked wrong or something's not quite right. You know, as these suction pump recalls came out, I had kind of already moved off the line, so I haven't really done enough of them to say, you need to check this exact little piece because I've seen this messed up. I would want the entire job rechecked. If you're not smelling fuel though, odds are they did it correctly, but it never hurts to check and have them inspected. As far as getting it checked when you come back stateside, that won't be a problem. I don't know how that's gonna work though with a recall executed overseas and then now brought back to the States for a recheck. That could get a little hairy, it may not, it may be totally cool. Just understand that there may be some hiccups or some bumps in the road. I wanna say, and I'm not 100% sure about this, so you'll need to consult your owner's manual. If you buy a car in the States, take it overseas, and then bring it back. I think your warranty still applies. If you're not sure, pick up the phone and call Volkswagen of America. 
because Volkswagen of America is going to be the one that's going to make that final decision. So I wish I had a more pinpoint answer, like check this thing right here, uh, but I don't. That's not a really common thing, but hopefully uh, it's not a big deal. And remember, guys, a one second delay is a long time. It's All right, next one comes from Joe. I have the panoramic sunroof in my 09 Tiguan, and when I open it, I get a terrible smell. Where is it likely coming from, and can I fix it at home? I think this has to do with the drain hoses for the sunroof getting clogged with debris over the winter, but I'm not sure. Last year I had to seal the hose connection since they were coming loose and leaking water into the cabin. I just can't seem to find the drain hoses on the sunroof side and wonder if I can just use some compressed air to blow out the tubes. Do you clean out this area at the dealership or is it best to replace the tubes? Thanks, Joe. Uh, we don't replace the tubes unless there's a problem with the tubes. The tubes are usually fine. You can use compressed air, okay? And it's a really good way to do it, but you gotta be really careful. You know, uh, when I think of compressed air, I'm typically thinking like the air that we have at the shop, full 120 PSI, almost unlimited supply of air, right? And for us, us DIYers at home, I'm, I'm looking at my compressor on the other side of the camera. It's a 28 gallon tiny thing that'll barely run an impact. That's not quite the case. So. You can use compressed air, just be really careful because it is easy to blow that tube off of the sunroof track, especially if it's clogged. So you can check the fronts really easy. You can park the car on a level ground, you can park it with the nose slightly down and then open the sunroof all the way. If you look in the track, you can see the two holes in the front corner. You just take a bottle of water or something, I wish I had one here, a bottle of water and, and put it in that track where the holes are and see if it drains. If not, you can try and wipe that out, take a little bit of compressed air, just a little ch -ch 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 like that. Don't hold your uh, air gun all the way and really blow it through. Um, again, you can knock the hose off. That's a good way to do it. Um, years ago on the Mark IVs, there was a recall to cut the sunroof drain tabs and clean out the drains. And we actually had this like snake thing that we would snake down in the tube. Uh, I thought it worked terrible because it ended up knocking the bottom part off more than working well. So you can find something flexible like that. I'm sure the local Home Depot or Lowe's will have something like that where you can fish it down in there and really get those drains good and clean. I will say that's kind of an odd issue that I don't think I've ever had is someone having the complaint of a bad smell when they open the sunroof. You know, I've had all the other bad smell complaints of just the interior smells, the HVAC smells, that kind of stuff. But Joe, thanks for that one, because that's a first for me that I've ever heard. So yeah, I think starting with those drains is a really good idea. Taking a rag and wiping that out is a pretty good idea. Maybe even a vacuum, depending on how much debris is in there. But that's a really good starting point. And again, clean that stuff out as best you can without going full throttle. I can't stress that enough. Do not go full throttle with the air gun develop a little touch for it, a little finesse with it, and uh, just try and ease those drains clean. All right, next one comes from Mark. How to protect Volkswagens from rust. Don't live in the rust belt. I'm just kidding. Uh, actually, I'm not kidding, that would totally work, but let's help Mark out a little bit. I'm about to purchase a new Golf. I and my father before me generally keep cars forever, 400 to 500,000 miles. That's awesome meticulously mechanical maintenance and somewhat straightforward and so is exterior interior cosmetic maintenance. But rust protection for those of us who live in the rust belt is not. The internet is full of passionate and strong opinions, just like everything else. Some advocate annual oil-based fluid film, some rubber-based coatings, either camp claims the other does not work. In Volkswagen forums, some claim Volkswagen's factory galvanizes enough with the occasional power washing that's all that required. In fact, some Volkswagen dealerships don't even offer to upsell undercoats anymore, which was usually a high pressure upsells. I remember getting getting really high pressured for the, uh, the undercoating. Here we go with the add-ons, right? What plan do you recommend to keep my car rust-free for 20 years? Huge fan of the show. No pun intended, but all of the YouTube mechanics, you guys are mostly humble and relatable. Thanks, Mark. So, um... Mark, I appreciate the kind words, man. I'm, I'm laughing at that. Here we go with the add-ons thing. If any of you know where that's from, post it down in the comments section because I'm just picturing, picturing the cartoon. I'll give you a hint. Um, so how do we keep our Volkswagens rust-free? Well, I grew up in the Chicagoland area, right? So rust prevalent 
as prevalent can be in that area. Um, as a technician or mechanic, whatever you prefer, I don't care, I live in the southeast United States, so rust is this much of an issue, which I am so, so thankful for. All of you guys up north and in the Rust Belt, I don't know how you work on cars. Uh, you got a lot of respect for me because that's, that's a lot of hard work that I don't know that you guys necessarily get paid for. Um, back to Mark's question. So how do we keep it clean? Uh, Mark, I think the guys in the Volkswagen Forum are, are pretty spot on. You know, we don't offer the undercoating here at my dealership, but that makes sense because it's not really something that people are too concerned about here. But where you are, uh, definitely, right? So in my experience, the best way to keep rust from your car is keep it clean and keep it waxed. You know, back back home, I, I still call it back home, uh, in the wintertime, I would take my car to the car wash once a week. I wouldn't use soap or anything like that. I would just spend like three bucks and power wash all the salt off of it. And that, in addition to keeping it waxed and, and all that, I, I, that was my big thing. I just kept, kept the salt off of it as best I could. Um, remember that Volkswagens are also dipped that, I don't know if you guys have ever seen underneath, there's like a white waxy substance, it's called cosmoline. They're basically bloop, bloop, dipped in undercoating, and that's probably why a lot of the VW forms say don't worry about it. And in my experience with body rust, right, um, it's very, very minimal, and typically, not always, because there are cars that do rust, that's one of the reasons why VW has a really long rust warranty. I actually think most manufacturers have a really long time and or mileage rust warranty, but most of them rust from exterior damage. So a rock chip, water gets under the paint, bare metal. Now we start to rust. We get that cancer that goes, you know, all across the hood, the hood and the fenders on the newest, the newest Volkswagens that are rusting, which is going to be like Mark V, uh, are, are the common places. So Man, keep it clean. If you get a rock chip, seal it. Seal it with paint, seal it with clear coat. Volkswagen's clear coat and uh, touch-up paint are really, really good. Their rattle can is among the best paint I've ever used. So if you get, get that, get it fixed right away. Keep it clean. Power wash underneath is usually all you need. Also remember on a lot of Volkswagens, there's a lot of plastic underpanning. So you wanna try and keep salt from building up in there. Again, this is not something I deal with all that often. So if you are a Volkswagen owner of a new Vol newer Volkswagen, help Mark out and give him your tips for keeping your car rust free. These are just some of the things that I've done in my life to help keep rust off my car. Uh, I think I've owned one or two cars that had some rust on it. My Mitsubishi was pretty rusted out, but it lived its life in the rust belt too. So you know the, the bottom corners of the doors and the fenders had their issues. Um, and if you see a thing develop, get it fixed right away. Don't wait until it's like this big, right? As soon as you see that little speck, if you're keeping cars, you know, in really good shape for 20 years, you're probably going to notice that speck. Keep an eye on that kind of stuff. Get it fixed right away. Good wax, good cleaning, good clay bar. Keep the dirt off of it. Fix any problems. And uh, my guess is you won't worry about body rust then the rest you're gonna have to worry about is the things like the bolts for the suspension, the brake caliper bolts, the uh, parking brake cables, that kind of stuff. Keeping that stuff clean too, so even cleaning it and drying it is probably not a bad idea. But Mark, I hope that helps. I wish I didn't even have to answer that question because rust, rust, right? We all hate rust on our cars. But uh, anybody else that has any really good rust prevention tips for you folks in the Rust Belt, down in the comment section, and let's help them out. All right, last one of the day comes from Alejandro. First of all, I would like to thank you for your efforts in working on your YouTube channel. It's been very informative and helpful for me and my friends. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Second, I would like to ask you for a minute of your time. Uh, I got a 16 1.4 with a DSG around 7,500 miles. It makes an odd noise when it idles after a cold start. Checked with other friends with a 1.4 TSI. None of them seem to have the high pitch noise. Went to the dealer and mechanic said it's normal even after scanning didn't send an error message. The no fault problem is common theme today, isn't it? So I'd really appreciate your opinion. I don't know what to do. I really like the car, but the noise puts me down. I understand. By the way, the owner of the car doesn't use it. 
So the two times I went to check it was a cold start after a while of not driving, once after 20 days or so, and the second time after a week. I drove the car and it works fine and drives super nice. Best regards, sorry for bothering you with this, Alejandro. Alejandro, if I did not want these questions, I wouldn't invite you guys to send them to me. Now, he sent us a video, so let's watch and listen really close to this video. <laughs> All right, so I don't know that I've ran into a 1.4 with this issue. I think I've had a 1.8 with this issue, though. One of the things that's concerned me is the lack of driving that this car really gets. So you're getting all that oil bleeding out of what I'm going to guess is the cam adjuster slash spool valve, and it's just taking a second or two for that to get up to the top of the engine. If it did it once, that's what I would say, but this is happening like four or five times in this video. It sounds weird to me. You know, one thing I think it's really important to point out though, guys, is that when we, as in all of us that we just watched this video, listening to it and watching it online, even though we can replay it over and over and over and over and over again, um, it's not the same as being there, right? We don't have that touch, that feel, that textile type environment that we can we can move our head over here and over here and back this way and up on our tippies and and rev the engine ourselves and see exactly what it's doing based on our input rather than someone else's input so uh, i always put that out there whenever we're trying to diagnose a noise problem unless it's like we've seen a hundred of them it's a timing chain you have no compression those are easy things like this are really really challenging um, what my diagnostic process would be with this. So you figured out how to duplicate it. That's step one. Step two is going to be getting it in an environment that you can hear really well and having someone help you open the hood, fire it up, get a stethoscope, right? Or a long screwdriver and put it up to your ear and, and start probing areas of the engine. And that's all you can really do. You know, you could maybe try chassis ears, maybe, um, that might be another good way. That way you can sit in the car with your headphones on and just click through your channels. Might help. I don't know. You could try one of those uh, microphone wand things and, and try and get it to the loudest point um, and, and isolate it there. But to me, this sounds top end, right? It sounds a lot like variators or cam adjusters or cam phasers um, that I've heard fail in similar ways. The one that I'm thinking of... <laughs> The guy did an oil change, uh, either didn't put the O-ring on for the filter or double ga gasketed the filter or tore it putting it on. I don't really remember. It pumped all the oil out of the engine. Went down, picked the car up, put oil in it, put a new filter on it, drove it back. And the only thing that was wrong with it, this really goes to show the resiliency of the 1.8 liter, is that a similar noise on startup for two seconds, three seconds. I mean, it was like that and it was gone. Um, and it ended up being the cam adjuster that was the problem. So again, to me, it sounds top end. It's really hard to tell, especially with the hood shut. It sounds louder and funky, but it's challenging when we're not there. So I would try again at the dealership, get it to where you can duplicate it with them. And if they still say it's okay, ask if you can get another car off the lot and try it against that one. You know, if it's a car on the lot, it's probably been sitting there for a couple of days. It should be as cold as it's gonna get. Fire it up, do the same thing, do that rev, and see what it does, because maybe it is normal, maybe it's not, but based on the video, it sounds funny to me. Now, I do think the 1.8s are a little bit loud and the 1.4s are a little bit loud. Uh, you're hearing some valve train noise, you're hearing injector noise. It seems to just be a louder engine than uh, than some of the older generations were. But I wouldn't settle for that's normal just yet. The way I would settle for that's normal is if one or two or three off the lot did it exactly like mine did, I'd be more okay with that. But that would be my approach as a technician, and that would be my approach as a customer if this were my car. All right, guys, great stuff today. Questions, comments, you know what to do. If you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. Don't forget to subscribe right here on YouTube and the notification bell. 
also over at HumbleMechanic.com. And hey, if you subscribe at HumbleMechanic.com, you don't have to worry about getting alerts that I just put a video out because you'll always get the email. Don't forget if you wanna help support me, support the show for 65 bucks a year, check out the crew membership program, exclusive discounts you can get nowhere else, content you can't get anywhere else, as well as a whole bunch of other really cool stuff coming soon. I'm really working hard on this program. The link is down in the description. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course on Snapchat. All right guys, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.